Hi, my name is Dr. Katie Monteleone. I am a general surgery resident at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in the Center for Abdominal Core Health. Today, I will be discussing an algorithm for repairing flank hernias. Dr. Rosen received salary support for his position in the leadership of the ACHQC, which is the source of the presented data. Other disclosures are listed here. The European Hernia Society defines flank hernias as defects occurring in the L2 region bounded medially by the lateral edge of the rectus sheath, laterally by the anterior axillary line, and craniocaudally by transverse lines 3 cm above and below the umbilicus. While this definition seems straightforward, flank hernias can involve other regions and may be in proximity to bony landmarks and neurovascular structures, which can create unique challenges. Likewise, there is no shortage of repair options. Surgeons have described effective results with open and minimally invasive repairs. Some approach these hernias similarly to ventral hernias with the patient supine, while others prefer to place the patient in lateral decubitus. And for open repair, there are multiple arrangements of midline and lateral incisions. Midline incisions allow one to access the medial aspect of the flank defect and the contralateral side of the abdomen, while flank incisions optimize access to the lateral aspect of the defect and to the retroperitoneum. For all of these decisions, if you choose wrong, you can't expose the most challenging areas of the repair. We hypothesized that there is a size threshold at which open repair becomes preferable to minimally invasive options. We also hypothesized that isolated flank hernias and those with a concurrent midline defect require distinct approaches to maximize surgical exposure and potential for adequate mesh overlap. And lastly, we hypothesized that the most challenging part of the case changes depending on how far the defect is from the midline. We set out to describe how these hernia characteristics, which can be defined preoperatively on imaging studies, influence our operative decision making particularly operative approach, patient positioning, and incision location. We use the ACHQC registry to retrospectively review flank hernia operations performed at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Abdominal Core Health over a five-year period. We queried the ACHQC for adult patients who underwent elective repair of L2 defects and had 30-day follow-up, and then excluded patients who had peristomal hernias or did not have preoperative CT scans. Using these parameters, we identified 85 patients. The etiologies of flank hernias were diverse. Isolated defects most frequently resulted from urologic surgeries, while flank hernias with a concurrent midline defect most frequently resulted from colorectal and liver surgeries. For isolated flank defects, the operative approach taken was related to hernia size. Isolated defects less than 10 cm wide were repaired with both open and MIS approaches, while those greater than or equal to 10 cm wide were nearly always repaired open due to the technical challenges presented by the bony and neurovascular structures located adjacent to the defect. For isolated flank defects, the patient position was related to the distance of the medial fascial edge from the midline. Isolated defects within 12 centimeters of the midline were usually accessible with the patient supine. However, those greater than or equal to 12 centimeters from the midline were nearly always repaired with the patient in lateral decubitus because otherwise it would be extremely difficult to access the retroperitoneum and the lateral aspect of the repair. When patients were supine, the incision was made either over the defect or at the midline. And when patients were in lateral decubitus, the incision was nearly always located laterally to provide optimal access to the retroperitoneum. When the medial edge of the defect was close to the midline, another incision may be made medially. In contrast, flank hernias with a concurrent midline defect were always repaired the same way, open with the patient supine and through a midline incision, sometimes with a counter incision over the flank defect to optimize the lateral aspect of the repair. The most frequent complications were surgical site occurrences, of which five required an intervention. One additional patient required reoperation in the 30-day postoperative window for an early recurrence. Patients were followed clinically for a median of 11.4 months, over which time there were three additional recurrences. 
patient reported outcomes were collected for 62 patients at a median of 30 months. During this time, 23 patients reported a bulge on their most recent PRO. The composite recur recurrence rate was 12 and included the four known clinical recurrences and eight patient reported bulges with no subsequent clinical evaluation. We measured quality of life using patient reported Hercules scores. While there was no change in quality of life at 30 days post-op, there was a progressive and significant improvement in the median and paired scores reported by individual patients at one year plus after surgery. We saw a similar trend with patient reported PROMIS 3A pain scores. The median pain scores decreased at one year plus after surgery, including a higher proportion of patients reporting lower than average and no pain, and individual patients also reported reductions in pain at one year plus after surgery. Based on these data, we developed an algorithm using preoperative hernia characteristics to guide the choice of operative approach, patient position, and incision location for flank hernia repair. This algorithm incorporates three questions. First, does the flank hernia have a midline component? Second, how wide is the flank defect? Third, how far is the medial edge of the defect from the midline? With regard to approach, for isolated defects that are less than 10 centimeters wide, we recommend either open or MIS repair. While for those larger than 10 centimeters, we recommend open repair. For flank hernias with a concurrent midline defect, we generally recommend open repair. However, MIS approaches may be suitable in some situations where the defect is small. With regard to positioning and incision location, for isolated defects within 12 centimeters of the midline, we recommend supine positioning and a midline incision to allow the mesh to be placed across the midline and in the contralateral retromuscular position, ensuring adequate medial coverage of the defect. For isolated defects 12 centimeters or more from the midline, we recommend lateral decubitus positioning and a lateral incision because it is much easier to gain access to the retroperitoneum. For flank hernias with a concurrent midline defect, we recommend supine positioning and a midline incision to ensure adequate medial coverage and exposure of the defect. And we recommend considering a counter incision to provide extra lateral exposure and coverage. While the thresholds we have identified in our algorithm are not hard and fast rules, this is a useful guide and a starting point for an ongoing discussion on strategies for flank hernia repair. Thank you for your time.